great to represent nutrition. We're not so new as land, but we're a very vibrant and dynamic group. Um, process side, we have a very diverse membership that come, and you know, again, the kudos to Australia. Imagine having Australia come to some of your meetings, given the time difference that uh, we actually have. So that's fantastic. Um, we've had five sort of conference calls amongst sort of members. These are our general sort of working meetings when people are reporting back on what they're actually doing. And one of the benefits of the diverse membership that we have is we're linked to virtually every major nutrition process that's going on globally. And so each member is bringing different aspects of that to the table. So we get the regular briefings on what's going on and then we have more specific briefings You'll see Feed the Future, the major US initiative, so they have um, a global learning and evidence exchange which was gender and nutrition, we often pick up the gender aspects in this as well, and agriculture, UNICEF's major conference on child nutrition which was hosted with um, France, Nutrition for Growth with DFID, um, nutrition related events at the CFS, I mean Nikita talked, we hosted one ourselves with uh, GFAR and the Gender and Agriculture Partnership but equally we're involved in several other events that partners were engaged in. Um, we're connected um, quite significantly to the new global panel on agriculture, food systems and nutrition which was also launched at the G8 with the, the land initiative so we're part of that. Um, we were at ICN2, which is the major FAO conference, which was the preparatory work was in November. The major conference will be next November. Um, and the UNSCN seminar. So we did three virtual briefings. Um, the mainstream in nutrition and agriculture investment plans is actually CADAP, and we're hoping to engage far more with CADAP2 on agriculture and nutrition. Um, CADAP's expressed interest in incorporating nutrition more broadly and it's not up there but hot off the table is we're likely to also be with the um, new global panel who are looking to do an event at CADAP to, at the CADAP partners meeting in March and so we hope to be bringing in nutrition with them through that. Um, I'm going to come back to the mycotoxins one um, because you know, this is about process, but I can't do this just about process soon, you know. And, you know, we interviewed Ernan, who's great, you know, get Ernan to do interviews with you, because he does a great interview. Um, and we did the, the side event. After toxins and nutrition, you know. Those of you who know me well know I am not going to stick to having meetings we you had. So take a look at this slide. On the left-hand side, this is the aflatoxin load in human blood, children's blood, the blood test. And on the bottom, HAZ for those who don't know is stunting, WAZ is weight for age, it's underweight. As the aflatoxin load goes up, so does stunting and underweight. These aflatoxins, for those of you who don't know, are caused by a fungal infection in the field, but actually once the toxin starts to develop, it develops far more in the drying and storage process, which we pay very little attention to because it's generally female farmers. So, you know, I fully intend to be controversial because I only have a few minutes. It's the only way to make you ask me questions afterwards. So basically, what you could say is female farmers are working their butts off in the field to produce food for their kids, which they're then poisoning them with. Did you hear that? Women are poisoning their own kids and potentially killing them. In Kenya, when it's bad, people die of aflatoxicosis. And this is agriculture. This is agriculture and nutrition, guys. We should be doing something about this. We cannot leave it to just, yeah, we should be doing something. We should be recognizing the issues. And so within the group, when we did the briefings, it had quite a powerful impact on people. And so it is one of the areas that we are also taking forward this year. So we hope to do a workshop joint with the Global Food Safety Partnership, which will also um, bring in many of you, to get a broader inference for agrotoxins, to look at the types of things we could be doing, and there are many strategies which could be done to prevent this. Um, we're also looking at gender, agriculture, and nutrition, um, because we, we sort of had a gender work group sort of, which never sort of happened. Um, so we often bring in 
gender through ours because you know women are a link very clearly between agriculture and nutrition. So that's what I'm um, we're looking at attention to the post-2015 agenda. Um, it's sort of, there's so many aspects of the dialogue on post-2015 going on in so many different areas that it's actually quite a difficult nut to crack. Um, but given the diversity of our members and given the diverse forums that they're in, the process we use is to infiltrate through different members into different sort of things. So that's one of them. Um, the one that's not shown there is CADAP because that one was new on the table. So it's a case of how do we get CADAP in phase two to take more attention to nutrition? How would they monitor that? What would be the indicators? I can see us doing far more on indicators this year, largely because, um, and I'm not sure if it's happening in your agency, but all the agencies I'm familiar with, where agriculture is being asked to do nutrition, the next question is, ah, so I measure stunting? No, 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 absolutely not. Do not measure stunting, because in most cases, an agricultural intervention is not going to change stunting. We need to be looking for other types of indicator that measure what ag agriculture will do as a contribution to nutrition. But because the main indicators everybody knows are stunting, underweight, and wasted, they immediately think they have to do that. So I think changing some of that discourse um, and looking at different types of indicators will be an important process. And part of that is sort of, you know, the other thing I would say to you is, as ag people, it's like, you don't own food anymore. You own commodities. You produce commodities that are sold to traders and brokers that are bought by the food industry to give food and nutrition. And that's what happens in Europe, North America, wherever. It's also how we look at agriculture in the developing world, and that should not be what we do, because agriculture is intimately connected to food in the developing world, but we don't think of it in that way. We don't look at the basket of food that we're actually producing. And so if we carry on the way we are, it will evolve in terms of its food systems to the same problems that we actually have today with overweight and obesity and high sugar diets and high fat diets. So we actually should be doing something different. And that is part of the agriculture and nutrition nexus and why it's important that we continue to work on it. Um, we also always have our eye on any key events that we can, you know, fly the flag. So CFS next year, ICM2 next November are two that are already on the calendar as well as I say the Cala Partners meeting and others along the way. So I will leave it.